All right. Cool. Welcome everybody. My name is Alexis. I'm the coordinator for Tryon Creek Watershed Council. I use she, her pronouns, and thank you for joining during our lunch hour today. Um, one of the things that we start all of our events off is some of you might be familiar with a land acknowledgement. And what this is, is just taking a moment to essentially acknowledge that um, Tryon Creek hasn't always been called Tryon Creek, right? Several of us have been sharing in the chat our relationship to Tryon Creek or our place in Southwest Portland. And these places haven't always had those names. Um, one of the things that I really just love about my job is that I get to um, steward this place and, and help it to be ecologically healthy. And, and that's work that has been happening for thousands of years, right? The native folks that have lived here um, since time immemorial have been actively stewarding this space for, for a really long time. And so um, we just find it important to kind of be grounded in the fact that um, me carrying on this care is a relatively new part of people and land relationships right here. Um, so the, the names of the um, tribes and bands of the Clackamas and of the, of the Columbia and Willamette River systems um, that might have typically used this space are shown on the left-hand side, and you can also see the dotted lines um, indicating different territories. So this is from our online interactive uh, web map. And um, so those are the Clackamas Chinook, the Willamette Tumwater, the Wasco Wishram, the Watlada and the Multnomah and other Chinookan peoples. There's also the Tualatin Kalapuya, Cayuse and Malala, and as mentioned, other tribes and bands of the Columbia and Willamette rivers. So it's, um, I think all of us are probably here today because we appreciate spending time in nature. We appreciate being near creeks. And uh, we just take the time to acknowledge that like, it's a shared duty and responsibility for everyone here to be active in that stewardship and that it's a relatively new thing um, for, for me and my ancestors to be caring for this place. Okay, Kyla, if you could go to the next slide. Thanks so much. So the Tryon Creek Watershed Council, uh, we sort of have three main work areas. We're a pretty small nonprofit based here in Southwest Portland and Lake Oswego. Our main work areas are restoration and stewardship. So we have, you know, we manage grant funded projects working with private landowners. Uh, to do things like remove invasive plants and plant native plants. We also provide that um, work as an option for volunteers. We have a big annual um, volunteer event every March called Watershed Wide, as well as other events throughout the year. We also have a focus on community engagement. So we have a Watershed 101 workshop program that allows us to kind of bring education work to different groups and pair that with some hands-on restoration activities like teaching folks how to grab out blackberry or we get to plant native plants together and things like that. We also do uh, a fair amount of kind of convening restoration practitioners and land managers in the Tryon Creek watershed. So um, I realized that um, my little the participants uh, button thing, the little screen might have been blocking the pop-up that showed up that was showing um, the Tryon Creek watershed and the Tryon Creek State Park. So a lot of folks are familiar with the Tryon Creek State Natural Area or State Park, but are maybe less familiar with the actual watershed itself. And the headwaters to Tryon Creek start in the Multnomah Village neighborhood and flow right under I-5, right? And so this creek moves through a lot of different types of spaces and um, bringing together the different folks that have a role in stewarding this place is one of the things that the Watershed Council does. So next slide, Kyla. Thank you very much, awesome. So this is just a screenshot from our interactive web map. We're having a couple bugs with some of the layers right now that we're working on solving, but we, um, I just invite you to, to visit that. It's on our website and pretty easy to find. There's a lot of different layers to toggle on and off, and it's a cool way to get to know the watershed. Next slide. Awesome. So um, we also want to thank our funders. So the science talk here is um, supported by the City of Portland's Bureau of Environmental Services uh, QUISP or Community Watershed Stewardship Program. That's also the program that funds the Watershed 101 workshops that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then Kyla's research has been supported by 
the Brenda McGowan Award for under, I'm not going to name it and I should have it fully typed out, but there's a, a Brenda McGowan Award that NARI, the Northwest Ecological Research Center has, or Institute, excuse me, um, that is for like under, under research niches and corners of, of ecology. And so that's part of what funded Kyla's time, as well as um, the University of Oregon Center for Undergraduate Research and Engagement. We have a thing called FIRE. It's the first year research experience. And that has played a role um, in supporting Kyla's work. So I get to introduce Kyla now. Kyla is a sophomore at the University of Oregon's Clark Honors College. She is studying environmental science with a focus in life sciences, uh, along with a degree in interdisciplinary humanities and minors in English and economics. At the UO, Kyla is the editor-in-chief of the Undergraduate Research Journal. She's also a research assistant in the Sutherland, Sutherland Lab and a forensics coach and competitor, among other endeavors. So this summer, Kyla will continue um, to conduct crayfish monitoring. This will be her third year. Um, she'll be doing so alongside the Watershed Council, thanks, as mentioned, um, to funding from the University of Oregon and support from the Watershed Council. Um, Kyla hopes to expand her in-stream monitoring this summer to encompass other organisms like sculpins and salamanders. So uh, with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kyla. Kyla, feeling good? Any questions for me before we turn it over? All right, um, I'll go ahead and take it away. So as Alexa said, I'm Kyla. I go to the U of O and I'll just be talking a little bit today about some of the research that I've done with the Tryon Creek Watershed Council in Tryon Creek over the past few summers. So before we begin, we're gonna do a little baseline test. Um, we'll see how much y'all already know about crayfish um, and Alexis will do a little poll. Um, so the first question is how many legs, including claws, does a crayfish have? Um, the answers are six, eight, 10, or 12. All right, and I can see that we have, we're reaching 75% participation. We're getting there. And so we'll give you guys just a few more seconds. There's about five people that are still waiting to fill it out. And I know that um, when there's some folks on their phones, they can't necessarily fill it out anyway. So we're gonna give you guys like five more seconds, five, four, three, two, one, and the poll and share the results. All right, so the majority of you um, said that they have eight legs. Um, that's a good guess. They actually have 10, um, so they're kind of unusual in that sense. So they have four walking legs and then there are two big claws up front. Um, all right, let's go on to the next question. So that is true or false? Crayfish can regenerate lost limbs. All right, people are quick on the draw this time. Okay, cool. We're at about the same amount of participation, so another five seconds. Three, two, one, there we go. All right, and the majority of you are right. So if a crayfish loses one of their legs, one of their antenna, one of their claws, they can begin to grow it back. And we'll see some examples of that later in the presentation. Um, third question, how long can a signal to, which is our native species, but crayfish in general live in the wild? Um, so answers are one year, two years, five years, or 10 plus years. So I'm a bit slower, people are thinking. <laughs> okay, great, we're at that same threshold, another five seconds. Three, two, one. Okay. So good guesses, um, y'all were in, in a good ballpark. Um, the correct answer is 10 plus years, but on average, you know, we'll see about two years in Tryon Creek and we'll go into that later, but that's the kind of mean age, but they can live 10 plus years. Um, finally, just a kind of fun one, are crayfish more closely related to shrimp or crabs? Mm -hmm. 
This one's fun. And Kyla, I might have to ask you later when you have, in case you don't know off the top of your head, when I've been putting stuff out, I've been using the little lobster emoji. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's also in the category of seafood. <laughs> right. Which is where they were on the keyboard. <laughs> All right. And I'm going to give us five more seconds. Three, two, one. So this, this is a trick question. Um, Y'all gave the intuitive answer, which is that crayfish look more like shrimp, but actually scientists think on the phylogenetic tree, they're actually more closely related and have a more common recent ancestor with crabs, true crabs. All right. And then Alexis, did you want to do that um, last question? Yeah, we can do the fun one now. All right. This one so it's is kind a, of a, yeah, go, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. I was going to say, this is kind of a bonus question. Um, it's kind of a precursor to some of the results that I found in my research. So how many crayfish, if you were just walking through the creek looking, would you expect to see per square meter um, or per 3.3 .3 square feet? And this is a little bit up to debate. This is based on the findings of my research. All right. Yeah, people are taking their time thinking on this one a bit too. All right, I'm gonna give us a countdown from about five or 10 seconds. A couple more people are still submitting. Okay, five, four, three, two, one, done. Okay. Um, so we got a good spread of guesses here. Um, so my research found that they were around one crayfish per 10 square meters was about the density that I found. However, other studies in other locations have found them at much higher densities. And so they've had, I think there's been some studies where it's like 10 plus crayfish per square meter. So the density can really change based on the habitat. Um, all right, so I guess now we'll move on. So some of you might be wondering why crayfish. You probably mostly have think, thought of crayfish in the past in the context of a crawfish boil as a cuisine item. But crayfish, you know, before they make it to the pot, they have vital roles in their ecosystems too. Um, and the first one of that being that they're ecosystem engineers. And what that means is that they do something to affect kind of the fundamental characteristics of their habitat in, in its physical form. Um, in the case of signal crayfish, they burrow into silt, which can affect water and sediment flow. Um, and I've actually seen them, you know, it's kind of, a, I think a predator response where they kind of just bury themselves in silt when you come near. Um, but crayfish in other locations can actually construct burrows that, you know, burrow for feet or meters into the riverbank. And these can certainly affect how kind of the morphology of that habitat is constructed. Next, they're detritivores. That means that they eat decomposing organic matter. Um, and that's really important because it recycles and makes accessible these nutrients that, for example, species like pike minnow who eat signal crayfish wouldn't otherwise be able to access, right? Those pike minnow aren't themselves detritivores, but by eating crayfish, um, they can kind of consume that energy and recycle those decaying matter nutrients. They're also used by people as bioindicators. A bioindicator is a species that humans can use to monitor how well a habitat is doing. Um, in the instance of crayfish, they're commonly used for monitoring heavy metals such as lead and mercury. And so scientists will um, sometimes dissect tissue from the crayfish to see kind of the presence level of those heavy metals. They can also just look at how well the crayfish population is doing. If it seems stressed, it might be an indicator that there's something off in the water quality. They're generalists. Um, so that means they basically consume a whole bunch of different things. Um, as you can see with them being detritivores, they also eat living organisms. Um, some examples are that they can control aquatic plant growth and they've been seen to do so in some lakes um, where they, you know, they prevent those plant populations from growing too large and kind of um, outcompeting animal life. Um, and there's also been instances of signal crayfish eating exotic species, such as the Chinese mystery snail, which has been found in Oregon, 
um, and is this invasive kind of large aquatic snail that crayfish are able to crack into with their claws and consume, which is good for us because it means they're helping us fight that, that um, exotic species and help stem its kind of impacts on the ecosystem. Finally, um, as some of you might have known from seeing crayfish around in the park, they're prevalent. Um, we normally think of Tryon Creek in terms of trout or salmon, and those species are fantastic, but they're not the most common species to find in the stream. Um, crayfish are a lot more common to see, um, and so it's kind of important to talk about these species, since these are the ones that we're most likely to encounter in our day-to-day -day walks in the park. So let's zoom in a little more specifically on the species. What are signal crayfish? So first off, they're Oregon's sole native crayfish. Some states like Michigan have up to 10 or more species of crayfish native to their region, but we just have the one. Um, and they're native to the whole Columbia River Basin. So not only do they um, kind of belong to Oregon, but they also reach up through Washington into British Columbia down through a sliver of Montana and into Idaho and just a tiny, tiny sliver of Nevada. Um, they can range in color from the kind of orangish you see here to kind of a striking and more rare blue color, which you'll see later. Um, and the average body length in Tryon Creek of the crayfish that I surveyed was about five centimeters. For reference, that's about the length of a matchstick. Um, signal crayfish, like many crayfish, are aggressive and they commonly lose limbs in fights with either other crayfish or predators that they're trying to defend from. Um, and we'll see an example of a regenerating limb later in the presentation. Crayfish, um, signal crayfish, like most crayfish, are nocturnal and so they will hide away under rocks and logs during the day. You might see them wandering about every once in a while, but they tend to kind of be inactive during the daytime and more active at night when they come out to hunt and forage. Signal crayfish in particular as a species, um, if you're wondering how to tell them apart from other crayfish, you can see this orange crayfish has a somewhat faint but still visible like light turquoise patch on their claw here and another one here. And so that little bright patch is, is why they get their name of signal crayfish and that signals to you that that is a signal crayfish. Um, signal crayfish reach a mature age between one and three years. And while they're um, native here in the Columbia River Basin, they're actually very invasive in other parts of the US and in Europe. And there's a huge thing going on in Europe right now with signal crayfish having invaded their watersheds and costing them actually millions and millions of dollars in ecosystem costs and erosion costs. Um, and an example that I like to bring up of crayfish being or signal crayfish being invasive, not only in just the US, but in Oregon itself um, is the example of Crater Lake. So as you can see, Crater Lake is gonna fall just outside the Columbia River Basin. Um, and historically, signal crayfish did not inhabit that lake. Um, at some point, um, people decided that they should stock uh, Crater Lake with fish to improve fishing and recreation activities. And to feed those fish, they stocked signal crayfish. This ended up having really bad impacts because while the fish themselves might have not changed the ecology too much, the crayfish um, were willing to actually consume the Mazama newt, which is a subspecies of rough skinned newt that is native only to Crater Lake. It's endemic there. And so we're actually seeing a kind of sad kind of progression of just signal crayfish increasingly consuming these Mazama newts which are toxic to most species, but somehow signal crayfish are managing to eat them anyway. Um, and we're seeing those numbers decrease. And so that's a really big example of why it's important to be mindful about these species. They might be really helpful in one location and really harmful in another. And to make sure, you know, if you're, if you're a fisher person, if you like to use crayfish as bait, that you're doing your research before introducing them or using them in a new body of water. <clears throat> So let's talk about some other crayfish invaders. So we know signal crayfish can be invasive themselves if displaced from their native basin, but actually we're seeing other um, types of crayfish come into our native Columbia River Basin and cause some problems for us. So there's four main types that are causing issues. It's the rusty crayfish, the red swamp crayfish, the ringed crayfish, and the northern crayfish. Um, and as you can see, there's some kind of distinguishing features here. These claws are longer and narrower and have bumps. The red swamp is really distinctive with their bright red bumps on their claws. 
And the ringed has these unique little black tips to their claws that are just tipped by the tiniest edge of orange. Um, and you can see that northern crayfish have this kind of flared tail with the kind of blue little filaments on the end. Um, and so these crayfish have all been introduced at some point or another into Oregon. You can see red swamp are the most common and most relevant to our Willamette River Basin. Um, but you can see that further down south, we've also had introductions of ringed crayfish. Out by John Day, there's rusty crayfish. And then way down south in Ashland, um, northern crayfish have recently been found in canal drainage down there. So if you see any crayfish like this in the wild, if you if you happen to go about your day and see one of these crayfish, um, keep in mind that you know that's an invasive crayfish um, that has the potential to outcompete and displace signal crayfish. And we've seen that happening in John Day, where they'll sample places where there used to be high populations of signal crayfish, only to find very few or no signal crayfish, and they've been entirely replaced and outcompeted by these rusty crayfish from the Midwest. So with all that context in mind, um, I wanted to go through the objectives of my research in particular, the first being closely related to what we just talked about, which is just to determine whether any of those exotic crayfish that have been found in Oregon are currently present in Tryon Creek in particular. Next, I wanted to characterize the signal crayfish population in this native Columbia River basin, because most past studies of the species actually look at them in Europe only, where they're invasive, but don't take into account the kind of morphological differences that they may exhibit within their native range. And finally, to measure environmental conditions at survey sites, so to see, you know, are these certain environmental parameters affecting crayfish population size or characteristics. Um, in this map here, you can see that um, these little check marks or these little pluses indicate the different survey sites that I surveyed from um, this past summer. Um, and you can see they go up all the way up in the watershed up to Marshall Park and Marshall Park here, and then down into Tryon Creek State Natural Area. And then finally down to Tryon Cove, um, which is kind of a little property owned by the city of Lake Oswego, right at the confluence of the Tryon Creek and the Willamette River. Um, now for methods. So I conducted 27 surveys in the summer of 2022 um, across nine survey sites in the Tryon Creek watershed, which I just pointed out to you. Um, each survey site was monitored once per month from June through August. Um, and in order to do this research, I needed to acquire three take or research permits, which basically gives permission to handle um, crayfish and to handle species. And, for any type of research involving fish or wildlife in particular, you're going to be handling one of those species. You're actually supposed to have a permit um, to kind of facilitate that work. Oh. Um, the surveys were conducted at night. If you remember, crayfish are nocturnal. And so we wanted to kind of be out there when they were most active and most likely to be emerged from their burrows and out and about where we could sample them. So in this survey, we use flashlights to search that kind of darkened creek and dip nets to collect those crayfish and to sample 100 foot sections of creek. So those were the sites is 100 foot length of creek. Um, and adults, juveniles, molts and claws were all collected and documented. After they were measured and photographed, all samples were returned to the creek where they were found. So I was doing a take and release process. Water conditions and vegetation were also measured as environmental parameters to characterize those sites. Um, and some additional observational behavioral surveys were conducted under the Highway 43 um, in that little box culvert that you may be familiar with, um, just to see how, if crayfish are acting differently when they're coming into contact with human infrastructure. So here's a little slideshow or a little collage that commemorates all of the people that helped with that research last summer. Uh, we had some friends and family of mine. We had some community members come out and volunteer their time. And all together, it was a, it was a pretty fun time. Um, and as you can see, we're out here searching the creek with flashlights um, and we're collecting crayfish in these little bins and kind of studying them from there. So on to some results. In terms of environment, um, basically we collected some basic water parameters, how wide the creek was at our sites, what the temperature of the water was, as well as pH and total alkalinity, and then flora species richness, which is how many different species of plants there were at any given site. Um, the nativity ratio just indicates what percentage of those plants were actually native. Um, so what you see here, I guess just a couple important things 
to highlight, the mean temperature of Tryon Creek in the summertime was 18 degrees Celsius, kind of notable as that is about 10 degrees cooler in Celsius than the Willamette River reaches in the summertime. Um, and as you kind of reach those 30 degrees Celsius water temperatures, that's where crayfish start to get strained and start to be unable to tolerate those warm temperatures. So it's really important for crayfish that they have habitat that can stay um, below 30 degrees Celsius. Um, you also see here that about 70% of the species found at these sites were native, so 30% invasive. However, of course, you have to consider that some invasive species are very dominant and that even though they might only comprise 30% of species, the actual vegetative cover of those invasive species might be a lot larger. Um, and here you see a snapshot of some of the species I have. You see some beautiful natives here with this like maiden hair fern. But then you also see some invasives as with like the wall lettuce. And then finally here is a, is a cool little thing. So this is a severed crayfish chele or, or chela or claw. Um, but you see these white little blobs here. Those are called branchiobedelidins. Um, those are crayfish worms. They're obligate symbiotes. So they live, they have to live on the crayfish to survive. Um, and they eat the food off the crayfish's claws. Um, and any given crayfish adult, you're more likely than not to find these little worms living on them. So they're very prevalent in the population and kind of an interesting environmental factor to look at. We're not quite sure what the relationship is there, whether it's like mutualistic or harmful to the crayfish, but um, those, were, those were observed um, on adult crayfish and not on the juvenile crayfish. So they do tend to live on larger crayfish. Okay. So in terms of distribution, I guess I'll break down this graphic first. So what you're seeing here is a picture of the Tryon Creek watershed um, in most of its extent. And the bright white spots that you're seeing are where the highest counts of crayfish were found. So you can see that we counted the most crayfish down by this confluence with Tryon Cove. Um, and you can see that there's also significant populations up north in Marshall Park. So on average, like our, our fifth quiz question was asking, about 0.08 crayfish were found per every meter squared, which is roughly one per 10 meters squared. Um, crayfish were present at all of the sites surveyed, so there was not a site where we did not find a crayfish. Um, and this included the Tryon Creek State Natural Area, which y'all are probably most familiar with. It's this large swath of land, Tryon Cove, which is down here and I've described earlier, and then Marshall Park, which is this city of Portland Park up here. Um, in Tryon Cove, we found the lowest crayfish density in June with only 0.02 per crayfish found per meter squared. Um, and then in North Creek, we found the highest density in August with 0.25 per meter squared. So that's a big difference by more than a factor of 10 between those two sites in terms of density. In terms of nativity, I bet y'all are wondering if we found any invasive crayfish in the creek. So the answer is no, which is really good news. None of the crayfish that we found were ID'd as invasive. Um, and this is awesome for converse, or conservation in Tryon Creek uh, because it means we don't have to start worrying about those invasive crayfish out competing and displacing our native signal crayfish as they've done in John Day. Um, and it indicates a limited spread of red swamp crayfish found at other points in the Willamette River Basin, for example. Red swamp crayfish have an established population about 10 miles away from Tryon Creek in Commonwealth Lake in Tualatin. And so understanding that those crayfish have not yet kind of reached a point where they're able to travel up into the Tryon Creek watershed is helpful news. And it's, it's good um, in terms of just stemming kind of the expansion of that invasive species. All right, so on to morphology. So the first thing that I kind of focused on measuring was total length, which is the length of the organism from the tip of their face all the way to the tip of their tail doesn't include these big claws, which can give them the illusion of being larger than they are. Um, and on average, um, a crayfish was 52.84 millimeters or 5.2 centimeters. The largest crayfish measured was 90 millimeters and the smallest was just 13 millimeters. Uh, it was pretty cute and we'll show a picture later. Um, I also looked at how often appendages tended to be damaged kind of as a proxy for how often they were fighting, how aggressive they were. Um, and so the average crayfish had 0.45 appendages damaged. Another way of saying this is that for every two crayfish I found, one of them would likely have a missing or damaged appendage. Um, and the, 
the most, the kind of crayfish with the most appendages damaged actually had 10 damaged appendages. And that was pretty sad to see. Um, it, the crayfish was mostly just body at that point. Um, and kind of an example I like to show is in this picture here of this orange crayfish on the left, you can see that they have a really small claw here in comparison to their claw on the right. But as you can see with the blue crayfish, they're meant to have two equal sized claws. And so what you see here is a claw that is in the process of growing back after being lost. So eventually this little baby claw will reach its full size and the crayfish will have two fully functional claws again. These crayfish are also a good example of coloration. Um, and so this chart here on the bottom shows the distribution or a rough kind of mapping of colors of crayfish that I found during my research. And so as you can see, there's there's some extremes, like there's a kind of a pretty bright orange off to the left here. There's a brighter greenish blue off to the right here. And then in the middle where there tend to be the most kind of counts of crayfish, and I should specify each number on this chart represents the number of crayfish counted with that hue and shade. So you can see that most of them tend to be kind of in this intermediate dusky hazel color. Final thing to point out about coloration is that it's ontogenetic with crayfish, meaning that it does change throughout their life, um, especially when they're reaching maturity um, at, from being juveniles. All right, on to pop biology and behavior. So the first thing I looked at here was age structure. Um, I was able to use these two equations from past papers in astrology, the study of crayfish, to relate basically their carapace length to their total and their total length to uh, their age. So I was able to kind of make rough estimations based on those measurements. And what you can see here is this is our smallest crayfish, 13 millimeters growing through the years. This is about on a, I would say half year interval. Um, you can see that they kind of mature, their body hardens and becomes opaque. Um, and so the average crayfish was about two years old based on the calculations and the surveying that I did. The oldest was four and a half years roughly, and the youngest was just 0.14 years. So a young of the year is what we call them, is a crayfish that was born that year and that is still very small. In terms of the young, young of the year, an interesting behavioral finding was that they, look, they appeared to be gregarious, which means that they live together, and so there were instances of many juveniles residing beneath the same cobble, for instance, so habitating under the same rock. Um, they were also statistically likely to be found at sites with other juveniles present. In fact, no juvenile was found alone at a site without another juvenile there, um, which means they probably didn't disperse too far from where their mother kind of laid those eggs. Finally, a behavior of note was burrowing. And so both juvenile and adult crayfish were observed burying themselves in silt. So um, just when a, when a surveyor would come by, there were a few instances of the crayfish just kind of using their claws and just kind of nestling down into the silt, probably as a kind of predator avoidance behavior. All right, and on to some human infrastructure kind of impacts and implications. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I did a case study on the Highway 43 culvert. That is this culvert here. Some of y'all may have seen it, some may have not. It's by Tryon Cove and it, it runs under Highway 43 going up into the state natural area. This is the outlet of that culvert. Um, and as you can see, there's a little step of water going into it. Um, and this culvert has been retrofitted with baffles, which are essentially little walls. And you can see kind of the edge of a baffle here that redirect water flow with the goal of making it easier for um, fish like salmon to swim up the culvert and migrate. Um, and there were some issues with crayfish in the baffles of the culvert. So they were observed navigating or attempting to navigate baffles and obstacles. So you see this one is doing a pretty impressive climb at a basically 90 degree angle, trying to use their claws to leverage up this wall of the culvert. Um, and you can see this one walking along the top. Um, but crayfish also sometimes became trapped by baffles. And you can see that in these three images where the crayfish has kind of become wedged between the baffle and the wall. Um, and there's a really strong water current running there. So if they do become trapped in there, it, it seems pretty difficult for them to fight that current, get out of that kind of little trap and escape. And so this just raises some questions about how engineering structures, uh, engineering structures to support fish, 
Should we be considering other species like crustaceans and benthic or ground moving organisms? Um, as we can see here, these structures were constructed obviously with, with fish in mind, but there's been instances where constructing things for the benefit of salmon, such as the example of Pacific lamprey not being able to climb up fish ladders, and now with crayfish not being able to navigate these baffles super well and encountering issues with them, we do have to begin to kind of look at these issues more broadly through a um, more ecologically focused lens and seeing that these crayfish are important members of the ecosystem and that we should be um, engineering structures that take into account the needs of a wider variety of species. All right, so on to kind of next steps. So what did this research tell us? First off, it told us that there's no invasives in Pryan Creek in terms of crayfish, which is great, um, but invasions may still well occur. And so this provides a useful baseline for how the signal crayfish population looked pre-invasion. So we can see, you know, 10 or 20 years down the line, if we do start to see, say, red swamp crayfish pop up in Tryon Creek, um, is that native population shrinking? Is it less dense? You know, do the crayfish grow to be smaller or younger than they used to? Um, we can understand how native and invasive signal crayfish populations might differ morphologically. So, for example, when we look at signal crayfish in Europe, um, a finding of my research was that when I look at the numbers for just like total length for sig signal crayfish in Europe, they tend to grow a lot larger there than they do here in Tryon Creek. So it's just an interesting question of how does a species, you know, being within their native range versus outside of it affect how they look morphologically. And this information may support the work of invasion ecologists and restorationists who are trying to kind of address these issues. And finally, the plan is to continue this monitoring. So in summer 2023, I do have funding from the U of O again to go back and continue to study this part of the creek. Um, the objectives are still TBD, but um, some things I'm hoping to do are to incorporate other cohabitating organisms that I've observed living with crayfish in the past such as sculpins and salamanders to see, you know, how these species overlap in their ranges and affect each other. To evaluate the population sex makeup and so to see if the sex ratio of signal crayfish is 50-50 male and female or if there's some variation there. Um, and to explore mark and release options to understand crayfish movement in different parts of the creek, particularly around the culvert where we can mark above in and below and see are those crayfish populations exchanging, are they kind of genetically isolated, are they all moving downstream and unable to get back upstream. Um, and so these questions are kind of think ones that I hope to address this summer. All right, and with that. I want to thank you all for listening to my presentation um, and I'm open for questions. I don't know if Alexis, you want to administer that, but I stand ready. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kyla. Um, that was really, really cool. Um, everyone who's tuning in, I got a sneak peek yesterday and it's, it's cool to see just some more photos and stuff today and get a better sense for, for what it was like out there. Um, we did have some people submit questions as they RSVP'd, so I'll visit a couple of those as we wait for chat um, to fill in. So um, one, one question that a couple of folks were curious about was a bit more maybe details on like the collection methods that you used, like how you, once you were out in the field, what did you have with you? How long did you spend at each site? What was your process? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so out in the field, I had, <laughs> so I had dip nets, uh, which are about maybe this big and kind of their, their frame and we use those to collect crayfish. We place them into actually Ziploc lunch containers. So those like plastic square sandwich containers are a pretty good size to fit a crayfish or two. And so we would place them in there. And then once the survey period was over, which we spent 25 minutes with those nets trying to collect as many crayfish as we could. Um, at that point, we then kind of looked shuffled through the sandwich containers and started to measure crayfish that way. Awesome. And I remember you, this is more like a, I already know the answer to this. Can you just talk about that one crayfish that was um, aggressive? Like you talked about them being aggressive with one another. Oh yeah. Um, the territorial so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was an instance, I had a friend who was helping me out with surveying in the culvert and he felt that he was chased by some of the crayfish in the culvert. And so that was an interesting finding was just, do they tend to be more aggressive there? Um, 
they they would actually at sometimes approach surveyors, which is a very kind of strange behavior given how large we are in comparison to them. Um, as well as um, I've seen like kind of crayfish like holding holding a little chunk of food and then other crayfish will kind of try to run up to them and they'll have to kind of evade them and defend their food. That speaks to one of the questions also that someone had asked um, in registering, which was like, what do they do with those big old claws? Like that was the, the, what someone had asked. So um, yeah, hearing, yeah, holding food and things like that, that's great. Um, in the context of next steps, how would you, um, how would you record, is, is recording the sex something that you're able to do in the field and what would be the, what would, what would you hope to learn through that? Yeah, so, um, and when you're sexing crayfish, basically the males have an extra pair of swimmerettes, which are little, small little like leg looking structures on the underside of their tails. And so that's how you can kind of dis distinguish them from the females. Um, and kind of an interesting, I guess, thing to look at with that is that past research has found that when crayfish are kind of colonizing new territories, that the males tend to colonize first, followed by the females. And so if we were to see uh, a larger ratio of males in the population, we might wonder if they're kind of more recently colonizing into that area that we've surveyed. Thank you. Um, let's see, uh, Glenn wrote, um, great suggestion for improving stream crossing infrastructure to incorporate all species needs uh, and asked if your study, if it helped you think of other stream corridor restoration or land use management strategies. Well, I will say um, it's, I guess it's always the struggle of, I, I did a lot of those flora surveys out by the creek and there was definitely areas where there was a very large amount of invasive plant species. And um, I know that those can be bad in terms of erosion, in terms of not providing the same kind of shade cover as our native species do. Um, and so I would think with kind of having seen and actually mapped out those invasive species that I'd like to hopefully be able to work with some folks at Tryon Creek to map out those species and maybe look at treatment options for them. Um, because there was a kind of, oops, <laughs> there was a kind of depressingly high kind of number of species like Himalayan blackberry, um, knotweed, all of that stuff. So that was definitely something that struck me is how just how many invasives we do have here. Um, but that being said, you know, there's still some beautiful native species that are providing great shade, like our alder trees, um, that were great to see as well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll, yeah, there's like a couple things floating through my mind. Um, Rebecca had asked in the chat earlier if, if um, Tran Creek warms up with the loss of ash trees um, due to emerald ash borer. So for those of you that aren't familiar, emerald ash borer is an invasive insect that's going to um, basically kill off most or all of Oregon ash populations and ash populations generally. Um, our fall science talk was with um, the state entomologist from the Department of Forestry. So with, and this fall, we're going to be um, providing, we're aiming to provide trainings for community members to learn to ID Oregon ash and signs of emerald ash borer. So what Rebecca was asking was, as you know, if, if Tryon Creek warms up in response to the loss of those ash trees, um, how might that affect the, the populations of crayfish? And so it's um, it's interesting to say that, um, or it's interesting that you mentioned like different canopy conditions in the context of where invasive species are. Um, and I'm reading Maha's question on the heels of Rebecca's saying, yeah, EAV emerald ash borer is Oregon. So because the leaf litter of ash trees are eaten by invertebrates, might crayfish be affected um, in, due to lack of invertebrates? And one thing I'll, uh, Kyla, I'll let you speak to that in a moment. And one thing that I would just say also for everyone is um, there, there doesn't seem to be a super high population of Oregon ash trees in Tryon Creek. We're, we're working on actually a habitat suitability analysis right now with a GIS student. So this is like me talking outside of the scope of Kyla's project. We're mapping right now places where Oregon ash is likely to occur in the watershed. And then we're going to follow that up with ground truthing and training and things like that. But a, um, a study in the, in the state natural area from several years ago didn't note any, or it was a very small section where there was ash dominant spaces of Tryon Creek. 
Um, so yeah, Kyla, did you want to add anything to that other than like, it's an interesting question about yeah. how, what the ecosystem impacts will be from EAB, Emerald Ash? Yeah, I, I can speak to that a little. Um, from the surveying that I did, I did, I think I did see some Oregon ash, but I want to say that predominant species were like the red osier dogwood, um, the alder, um, vine maple. So a lot of those trees still provide good cover and good leaf litter for the creek. Um, I do imagine that with loss of some of those trees, we'll probably see some kind of losses to those invertebrate populations and potentially to crayfish. But the kind of nice thing about them is that they are very generalist organisms. And so um, they, you know, they don't rely on one specific species to consume. They can kind of consume different species more broadly. So we could see a slight loss, but I would I would imagine them to be fairly resilient in the face of that. Um, and there was also a similar question about the warmer waters. Um, again, crayfish are more signal crayfish are more resilient than a lot of species when it comes to warming waters. Um, but it is you know upwards of that 30 degrees Celsius where they start to not be able to tolerate it as well. Um, so I don't imagine, you know, losing ash trees will make Trying Creek's water temperatures jump 10 degrees. But that being said, like it is something to still be mindful of, um, especially in terms of other species that can't tolerate those warmer waters like at all. Yeah, and, and this question about emerald ash borer and Oregon ash, I think is a, is a, is a conversation that we're having right here in the context of Tryon and is really something that's gonna be a statewide level impact in a state and that's why those, there's like I think seven different statewide response committees that are preparing to track those kinds of changes and incorporating lessons learned from other parts of the country that have dealt with that um, already. Um, Alexis, I have a direct message question from someone that they ask, are we still planning to replace the culvert under Highway 43, Tryon Cove with a bridge? Um, I thought you might want to speak to that since I know you have some expertise in that area. Yeah, definitely. So um, the so Kyla spoke about the Highway 43 culvert for everyone. Um, it was that square looking box um, that the, the Tran Creek flows through right before it hits the Willamette River, like about a quarter mile upstream. And so this this space of the watershed is is really high priority as far as habitat quality goes. Um, it's a it's a barrier to fish passage. So up upstream, up above the culvert in Tryon Creek, we have a really healthy coastal cutthroat trout population. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, did a study and found that the habitat of the co of the coastal cutthroat trout that we have is actually comparable to a population in an undisturbed rural area. So the the fish that we do have are healthy. But the ones that can't access the creek, um, such as coho and Chinook salmon and steelhead and other species that we've seen downstream of the culvert, they can't make it through that culvert. It's a 400 foot long box culvert. It's steep. The baffles have been put in to try and help that. And um, I've definitely inherited a legacy of advocacy that the Watershed Council has been putting forth for like 30 years. People have been saying we should get this culvert replaced. And it's finally, um, Pretty, it's, it's the furthest along it's ever been is what I will say to folks. It's a really um, large and complex project and an expensive one. There's like 10 different landowners and stakeholder landowner types in this project area, uh, including the state park, including local government, including uh, the Department of Transportation and private railroads, right? So um, the because it's so complex, no single entity has have yet been able to take the lead on it. Where we're at now is um, the project was listed under the Water Resources Development Act or WERDA for short and was included in a list of like a hundred packages that reached the federal, like the, the, president, the president's desk and got signed to be approved. So we've received appropriations that are coming back down and so the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers um, are going to be the lead. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers are the lead for this project. And the city of Portland are the lead as the non-federal sponsor. So folks are working together. This year, they've been doing kind of initial planning and design work. They're going to be doing some geotech surveys um, soon. And it's just a matter of getting funding. But that will really open up fish habitat. And it'll be interesting, Kyla, right now that we have this documentation of the ways that human infrastructure can adversely affect 
wildlife, even when we've done things like put in baffles to help fish move, it'll be interesting to see um, what comes out of the designs as we move forward. Um, that was kind of a bit of a rant. So the the, the long and short of, of is Highway 43 happening? Because I got that question directly too is, yes, the, the plans are, are moving forward. Um, okay, so I'm reading, Actually, I'll I'll take a moment. I'm not going to read the Thano Creek question right now yet because Kyla, I want to relay a couple of yeah. things earlier. Yeah, I think there is the one from the female crayfish yes. eggs yeah, is yeah, the last there's... next one we're up to. Um, so I did not see any female crayfish carrying eggs. I think they tend to unfortunately like carry in the entire off season of when I was sampling. So I think they tend to lay eggs in fall. They're carried under the female's tail up until spring when they're hatched. So that's kind of, you know, the kind of opposite season as to when I was sampling, but I would love to see that. I might try and do some sampling in like one of the shoulder seasons at some point, just so I can see if I can find any of those um, egg carrying crayfish, because it seems like a pretty interesting thing to be able to sample. Um, it does, yeah. Another question we got was, do signal crayfish walk on land? Yeah, <laughs> so that's a good question. They I guess the short answer is they can, but they usually choose not to. So if we, I guess, let me see if I can go back to um, this picture, box culvert. So you can't really see it in this picture, but along this kind of ledge where my cursor is, there's this little step that is sometimes underwater and is sometimes um, not underwater. And I had seen a crayfish like walking along that ledge trying to get up into the culvert so they were they were basically essentially using that ledge as a boost to get over this bottom kind of outlet lip so they can if they're motivated to if they have reasons to you can also see one walking out of water here um, but i think it's less common in signal crayfish unless they're like stressed and are like um, trying to get somewhere. <laughs> but I know that with some other species, it's actually a more common thing for crayfish to migrate out of water and on land. Um, but with this species, they're mostly aquatic. Thank you. That was great to see like an example of where specifically and why maybe you've seen them walking on land. Um, okay, yeah. So another question came through from the Friends of Fano Creek Headwaters. Um, so the headwaters of Fano Creek has had contamination issues. It looks like there was a contaminant dump into um, a site last fall and they and it sounds like there was a recent crayfish spotting. And so could you speak a little bit to the level of adaptability of signal crayfish and maybe what the implications could be as far as water quality goes? I know you mentioned them being bioindicators earlier, but that was in the context of metals, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert kind of on how, how, you know, signal crayfish interact with water quality from what I've seen and from what I've kind of just read in, in literature review, they, they are pretty tolerant of harsher conditions. They're, they're pretty adaptable as you ask about. Um, and so I don't know if a, a crayfish is necessarily an indicator that the water quality is like fully healed or back to normal, but certainly it's a good sign. Um, you know, crayfish, you know, they, they're going to be feeding on a variety of other species. So the fact that crayfish are present means that, you know, those species lower down on the food chain are also present. Um, and it means that, you know, that water quality is like roughly good enough. Um, I think they can tolerate pH levels a few points lower and higher than 7.0. Um, I don't know how that relates to the contaminant dump. Um, but I do know that while they are fairly tolerant, of course, all aquatic species have their limits, crayfish included. So it's definitely a good sign to be seeing living things there, I would say. Thank you. And I would also say, I don't know, just from what I know vaguely about salamanders, that seeing salamanders at that site is probably a really good sign because I know that they can be a little bit more sensitive than even crayfish. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see where you do and don't see salamanders this summer when you're paying more attention to those species. Um, okay, so I'll give a chance for any other folks to send questions in while I prime you up, um, Kyla, with one more. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit um, to essentially in full transparency for everyone that's tuning in. Kyla and I have been in touch with folks from the University of Idaho who are measuring um, 
like metals. Do you want to talk, do you want to speak a little bit to that, Kyla, and kind of the ways that they're hoping to um, expand their research into Oregon? In case sure, there's anyone yeah. here with more <laughs> connections across yeah, the state. Yeah. So I've been in contact with a, I think it's a, a PhD candidate, maybe it's a master's student at the University of Idaho, um, and they are studying essentially what I was mentioning earlier with bioindicators, how we can use crayfish tissue to look at mercury levels in different parts of, I think in their case, it was, they were looking at the Columbia River Basin. Um, so they were kind of looking broadly and they had asked me to help them out with some sampling in Oregon. And I, I wasn't so sure because their process kind of involves like taking crayfish out, boxing them up and shipping them to them where they then get killed, dissected, all of that. Um, but where they're kind of looking to move in a cool new direction is they're wondering if we can just snip off a crayfish's claw, which is regenerative, right? So they would grow it back and just take that claw um, and use that for the tissue analysis. So they're kind of hoping to potentially um, find a way of using crayfish as mercury bioindicators that is non-lethal, which um, is would be a great step forward. And I'm seeing how I can support them in that. Um, and we're kind of just waiting on to see if that is an effective way of sampling or if it's just not enough tissue. Yeah, and that'll be interesting as well because this spring they were asking us if we had any leads on sites where um, they might collect some gravid females, right? Which again, as you said, was kind of in the shoulder season compared to where you've been um, focusing. So yeah, it's, it's good to be in touch with folks that are, what's the name for someone that studies crayfish? Astacologists. <laughs> to be in touch with other astacologists throughout the region. Okay. I'm not seeing any other questions come through from anyone and we're actually right on time at one o'clock. Um, I'll give a few minutes for any other questions to come rolling through. Otherwise I, um, oh yes, Rachel, thank you. That was one of the things I was going to say was um, volunteers this summer. Um, Kyla and I are going to be connecting on um, what, what her capacity is for working with volunteers this summer. But assuming we do choose to open it up to volunteers, I'll make sure that everyone that attended today gets that email as well. Um, and, and Rachel, you asked specifically about teens and we did have some youth participation last year, I believe. Um, otherwise, yeah, we'll be in touch with those details. Um, and thank you everyone. Thank you for your thank yous to Kyla. The Watershed Council thank you, everyone. had a really great, um, great gift in working with Kyla. Um, so thanks everybody and um, have a really good rest of your day.